Welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Greg Jennett with you this Thursday on Ngunnawal Country here in Parliament House. And Fran Kelly with you in Sydney on Gadigal Land. Great to see you again, Fran. And we've seen the leaders fanning out pretty quickly today across what looked like some rain-soaked states in this vast country of ours. Yeah, that's right. After last night's debate and with their final close encounter behind them, it was back to the campaign trail, Greg, for Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese today. The Prime Minister headed south to Tasmania again, while the Labor leader headed north to Queensland to Gladstone in the Nationals' held seat of Flynn. Yeah, so day 31 brought announcements on new mental health services to be expanded across the island state. And for Anthony Albanese, more talk about wage rises and supporting onshore manufacturing of batteries. This new and final leaders to to the election campaign has crystallised cost of living pressures as the key battleground just nine days before voters head to the polls to decide just who will be Australia's next Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has again returned to Tasmania. Hey, Richard. The Labor campaign has rolled into central Queensland, Gladstone to be precise. I have been here five times in the Gladstone. I have been three times to Emerald. Thanks for having us at your workplace. Oh, thanks for being here. Australia should be powered by Australian-made batteries. What our plan is, is to have a boom, and a further boom, and a further boom. See you, hello. Already hello. taking calls whilst we've been is here. Is that right? Yes, you interrupt. These are out, these are out. We'll get out of your way. But the head to health services are as big a game changer as what Headspace was. A cup of tea or do whatever. So this is something that's very important to me. Sometimes there are life events that can completely disrupt your world. Our government has been on a mission on this for, for, for many years. This is a very difficult challenge. There's no doubt about that. Happy to take questions. Hang on, when, hang on. When the loudest yellow doesn't get the next question. We had Mr Albanese on the issue of wages be yes, no and maybe. This is about whether those people on the minimum wage in Australia get a dollar. The pirates, and where's Where the pirates the coming pirate? from? <laughs> he knows he got that wrong. He knows he acted recklessly and he's been trying to cover his tracks ever since. We will release all of our costings like other oppositions have in the, in, the usual, in the usual way, at the usual time. We have put 22 policies for costing and the Labor Party has a big fat zero. Not one, not one. Where's the money going to come from? And what we know is in this election, he can't answer that question. He goes suddenly in early or are we not? No, yeah, no, no. I pray every day. That's been my practice over a very long time. Yeah, a Scott Morrison here. bowling his way through Bass for the fourth time this election campaign. And I can assure you I'm fighting fit, full of beans, and looking forward uh, to the next 10 days. Well, that's not, that's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> they know I'm not much of a with this sort of and on and on it rolls. Just to signpost, Fran, you'll be taking a look in greater detail, doing a bit of a stock take, really, on mental health a little later in the program. Why don't we go back to wages, though, Fran, because spilling over from their debate last night, this argument rages on, rages on over wages. Uh, the Morrison government maintains that Anthony Albanese crossed a line by nominating a pay increase of 5.1% for the minimum wage case, and there'd be prosecuting an argument of economic recklessness for, what, more than two days now. Yeah. Scott Morrison's still running hard on it here in the third day, Fran. Yeah, well, actually, he's been running this line since the start of the campaign, hasn't he? The Prime Minister has judged that his best weapon in this election campaign is doubts about Anthony Albanese and questions about his economic management skill. That's been the script from the Prime Minister from the beginning and then in the last couple of days since the Labor leader declared that in government he would support a 5.1% increase in the minimum wage, Scott Morrison's been on a real mission to tell voters it was a careless promise. If you're a Prime Minister or a Treasurer, and you're just careless about these things. You're loose with these things. And you run off on the mouth about where you think wages should be or shouldn't be. That can precondition inflationary expectations in the economy. And it can actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
And that's why my, my issue is we all want to see wages increase, mm. but I don't want to see reckless behaviour in how the process should work. And this is where Mr Albanese has failed. He has had three positions on the one thing on one day. He knows he got that wrong. He knows he acted recklessly. All right, well, if Labor's been trying to put some boundaries around that original absolutely pledge that Anthony Albanese gave on Tuesday, Fran, that was when he was asked specifically about backing a 5.1% increase in the minimum wage case via a submission, then by today it's starting to become a little clearer where those boundaries might stand. So more than 200,000 workers are on the actual minimum wage, a couple more million on awards benefit when that minimum is raised. Uh, does it now appear, Fran, that any Albanese government submission to Fair Work Commission about a 5% rise would apply only to the first category with some sort of you know, firewall put in place for the rest? Yeah, it's a little unclear how he'd do it. But Anthony Albanese, I guess, has always talked about those on the minimum wage of 20, I think it's $20.33 an hour, and how his absolute, absolutely promise would mean $1 an hour more for these low-paid workers, and we've seen him brandishing that gold dollar. So I suppose it was always implicit in his words, although, as you say, a rise in the minimum wage over time does flow onto other awards. But asked again today about that, Anthony Albanese sort of said not necessarily. Do you support a minimum wage increase, not just for those who are actually on that $20 uh, rate per hour uh, of the day, but also do you support the minimum wage which is built into a number of awards across the country and how that would then flow on into other industries where people are earning considerably more than that? The Fair Work Commission, as you know, if you go back, draw a distinction regularly. When they look at the minimum pay, minimum wage and the national wage case, they draw distinctions about that all of the time. What I am talking about here is people who are on $20.33 a, a, an hour that the federal government says they should have their real wage cut. Last one. Last one. The Fair Work Commission does that. The, the Fair Work Commission do that. OK, so as you will have appreciated already in our coverage today, economic management, wages and the affordability of promises all remain very hotly contested. With that in mind, we spoke to Finance Minister and Coalition campaign spokesman Simon Birmingham just a few moments ago. <laughs> Simon Birmingham, the Prime Minister has been talking a lot of economic fire and brimstone about Anthony Albanese and wages, but today he does appear to have limited the scope of advocacy for a pay rise, pointing out that he may not be arguing for 5.1 per cent for, you know, up to 3 million workers, maybe as few as 200,000. Now, that would greatly undercut your arguments about inflation and interest rate pressures, wouldn't it? Well, Greg, what's evident is that Anthony Albanese is making it up as he's going along. Nobody seriously believes that a couple of days ago he was intending to put the 5.1% figure out there. It was a thought bubble that he came up with under pressure. He committed to it absolutely. He made it sound like it would be a formal Labor Party policy. He made it sound like uh, they would make this a formal submission to the Fair Work Commission. Uh, and yet since then, he and his team haven't been able to give a straight answer as to whether they stand by that figure how they came up with that figure or what they would do if they won the election. And this is just the type of incompetence and uncertainty that Australia can't afford to have in a Prime Minister. Uh, and that's why Australians really do need to look very carefully at the incompetence and the economic illiteracy we're seeing from Anthony Albanese. All right, but if we are only talking about 200,000, maybe up to 270,000 workers getting an extra dollar plus per hour, the inflationary consequences of that would be much smaller, wouldn't they, than other calculations around 2.7 million workers? Well, Greg, the thing I'm not going to do is hypothesise about different things the Fair Work Commission might do. Um, we have a process that we support that is thoughtful, that is considered, that backs the independence and integrity of the Fair Work, Fair Work Commission, but also ensures they are able to make decisions in the best interests of all aspects of our economy, including ensuring that jobs growth continues in Australia, that businesses survive in Australia, all of the factors that are equally important to ensure the well-beings of Australians. Uh, and that is why uh, the risk that Anthony Albanese is demonstrating in his make-it-up-as-you-go-along go, go approach 
is a very real risk uh, and it's a risk that we do need uh, Australians to think long and hard about whether this nation can afford. Well, can I take you to the matter of costings? You've been making much trying to uh, beat out of the bushes with Labor uh, a full suite of costings to go into Treasury and Finance. Yet back in 2013, it was Joe Hockey, you were on the scene at the time in a, a lower capacity, I suppose, uh, who the Thursday before polling day dropped uh, the whole suite of coalition policies for costing, minus the most expensive ones, uh, broadband, direct action and Operation Sovereign Borders. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander in these things, isn't it? Labor can do that next Thursday. Well, Greg, it's a matter for the Labor Party as to when they release their costings. But what we have highlighted today is the fact that of the policies they've committed to through the course of this campaign and prior to it, they're not being transparent about the total cost of those policies and they're not engaging properly in the costings process at all before you even get to aggregating up and releasing the total costings. So to take that second point I was raising, it's about whether your policy announcements are properly costed. We didn't just hand down a comprehensive budget pre-election, but since the election we have submitted the Liberal and National Party's 22 policy documents to the Departments of Treasury and Finance for independent assessment. They've published that independent assessment. It's on the internet for all Australians to see verification of the Liberal and National Party's policies and the costings underpinning them. Yeah. The Labor Party has the same opportunity to do that through Treasury and Finance or the Parliamentary Budget Office. They have submitted zero policies so far. Not one to date have they submitted. Just on childcare, the Prime Minister's uh, tried to suggest today that the cost of a Labor-style childcare policy, universal that is, would be run to about $18 billion over four years. Where did that number come from? Well, Greg, Anthony Albanese in the debate last night uh, talked about this desire of the Labor Party uh, to go to a universal 90% subsidy, regardless of how much money somebody earns. That uh, my family, if we were using childcare, would receive a 90% subsidy, and anybody else across the country would receive a 90% subsidy. Or they, they want to be guided by a productivity many... commission review. But yeah, that's not a qualification he's giving in all that many of his interviews or comments at present. Uh, what Anthony Albanese is hanging out there in his interviews and comments is that he wants to achieve a universal 90% subsidy. Now, you know what? Australians on the lowest incomes already receive an 85% subsidy on their childcare. Somebody on a Cabinet Minister's uh, income as a family receives no subsidy. Hmm. Now, why is it that Anthony Albanese wants to provide the greatest level of subsidy increase to the Australians earning the most? Because yeah. that would be the consequence of the policy he's aspiring. Even stage one of his childcare policies, a $5.4 billion policy uh, that isn't even paid for by any of their savings in, in totality. Even stage one provides the biggest benefit to higher income earners. There'd be a 5% increase in support for somebody earning under $70,000, but there'd be a 27% increase in support for somebody earning $400,000. Yeah. That doesn't sound like it makes sense at a time where we're trying to prioritise government spending to make sure we help those who need it most with their cost of living pressures, which is what our recent budget did. Well, I'm sure there'd be further work uh, to be done by Labor on that. According to them, there would be anyway. Can I ask you, finally, Simon Birmingham, wearing your finance minister hat, does fault or culpability need to be established for a Commonwealth employee to succeed in a workplace compensation? claim or are settlements negotiated regardless of agreed facts on conduct? Well settlements are negotiated at arm's length from ministers or politicians and the Department of Finance has made a clear statement on those matters making clear that uh, in relation to the Ms Miller matter which I suspect is what's prompted yes. your question yes. uh, that no ministers uh, have been briefed in relation to that because they are handled at arm's length. Uh, the Department of Finance talks about the process that is involved in uh, in those matters and I'd refer viewers to uh, to their statement uh, they've made it independently and they've underlined the fact that ministers are not a party to those negotiations nor are they briefed on them. So are we entitled to assume that in the Rochelle Miller case a settlement uh, could be reached without fault because if there had been fault then on the part of Alan Tudge or any other minister then the PM must have been told about it. Settlements in relation to employee separation matters uh, can be informed by a range of different factors. I think most employers across the country uh, would know that uh, and the public sector in managing uh, 
uh, settlements of employee separation also will consider the range of different factors that don't necessarily prescribe fault to individuals uh, but, uh, but can uh, identify other reasons as to why they may feel a settlement is necessary. OK, and is it ComSuper who ultimately pick up the tab on these payments? It's, uh, it's ComCover who, uh, who negotiates Com -cover, uh, the, uh, the terms around these sorts of things as part of, uh, as I say, as part of established processes in relation to public sector separation payments, which aren't matters for politicians and certainly, as the Department of Finance has made very clear, people like me are simply not part of those negotiations, are not briefed on them and indeed for privacy reasons are kept at arm's length from them. Yeah, understood. And I did misspeak. Com cover is what I meant to say. Simon Birmingham, thanks so much for joining us on Afternoon Briefing once again. Thanks, Greg. My pleasure. Well, Prime Minister Scott Morrison was in Tasmania today where he announced more than $55 million for mental health and suicide prevention in that state. The Prime Minister said the announcement was consistent with his government's support to tackle the mental health challenges across the country. We have great tools here and great services in Australia, world class, that can help people live with mental health challenges, overcome mental health challenges, to prevent uh, finding themselves in those situations. Some of the best, if not the best in the world. And as a government, we've been investing in them. We've been developing in them. And indeed, we've been pioneering them. And my government will always do that. That is the dividend of the strong economy that we've put in place. This is really the first time that mental health has featured in this election campaign. I'm joined now by Professor Pat McGorry, Executive Director of the Youth Mental Health Organisation Origin and founding board member of Headspace and Dr William Garvey, a de developmental paediatrician whose work includes child development and mental health. Billy Garvey, Patrick McGorry, thank you both of you for joining me. Thanks, Fran. Hello. Uh, Patrick, if I could start with you, this $55 million announcement for mental health in Tasmania today, is this what you've been waiting to see in this campaign? I think if you, just, if you look at Tasmania, and, and that combined with uh, what the Prime Minister announced um, um, a couple of months ago about... Uh, putting a, an early psychosis platform in Tasmania, which is really the, the backup system for Headspace, Tasmania is looking um, quite positive there. Um, so, but if you look at the rest of Australia, the government's doing a good job sort of building these backup systems for primary care for children now. Um, that's a new thing. Um, and the adult hubs are, are really taking shape for the older adults. But what we don't have in most parts of Australia is the backup system for Headspace for more complex and persistent illnesses in um, in young people 12 to 25 years. That is, a, is the missing uh, piece for the missing middle uh, okay. of these teenagers and young adults who have really borne the, the brunt of the um, of the pandemic in terms of the shadow pandemic. And, and also, it's the main period of life in which mental ill health surfaces for the first time. So let's, that let's... Is, the, is the piece I'm waiting to hear about. When is that going to be expanded and scaled up in the same way that the adult hubs are now being committed to. OK, let's talk a bit about the, the missing middle, because the Prime Minister references it today. It's a, it's a term you use a lot, and in fact, I think it's a term you probably came up with. Today, there was $25 million for adult mental health care centres, three new head-to-health clinics, the hubs you were talking about. Um, can, but you say that the, that the same facility is not there for, for um, uh, older adolescents. Can you tell us just a little bit what you mean by the missing middle and whether yeah. these head to health centres, why they are, why they are the answer and, and, and what we're not getting for young adults? Well, well, the missing middle is basically describes the, the people at, at any stage of the lifespan, but especially young people who are too complex or persistent for, for primary care alone. So, so we've got really good data from Headspace across the country, which shows that that about 35 to 50 per cent of the of people that go to a headspace center as a as a, an emerging adult um, will benefit from that from that treatment and they and they and they may not need um, a more intensive or persistent level of care but the rest of them whether it's between half and two thirds to, to actually make any improvement they need more than that they need um, a multidisciplinary team, including psychiatrists and a whole range of other professionals, to work with the young person, the family, over a longer period of time and with, with a deeper level of expertise. And um, so that, that is what we have designed for the government. And, and they actually are, are looking at this. Uh, so we're waiting to hear. Um, 
And we have six of those, those centres already in place um, across Australia, and Tasmania and ACT will get one soon as well, so there will be eight. But that covers a very small proportion of, of, the, um, of, the, of the Australian community. And everywhere else, the headspace, there's a big gulf after headspace and primary care between, between the primary care level and the emergency department. Um, so you know, that, that is the missing middle, the, these more complex and persistent illnesses. Now, the government is responding to that quite well in the adult sphere because they are building the adult head to health hubs, which back up GPs and, 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 and um, better access practitioners for adults, but we just don't have that, um, except in six to eight places in Australia for, for the young people. So I think the government thinks that um, Headspace is, 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 um, is, a, is, is the answer to that, but um, clearly the data show that it's not. We need okay. the backup system. Yeah, well, there was more money for another Headspace too in Tassie today. Billy Garvey, um, your area of expertise is with the younger kids. There's more than $12 million for three Head to Health, these hub things we're talking about, kids centres within the Tasmanian Child and Family Learning Centres today. There's 15 of those now pledged across Australia. As a paediatrician focused on mental health for young children in Melbourne, is this the solution and are these kids centres working? <laughs> Yeah, Fran, I, I know those centres are a great initiative that have come in and said, how can we go to where families are and skill up the professionals that are seeing them? And that's what I think is an amazing element about them. We know Professor McGorry, you know, is a leading expert in this field about how do we improve access and catch these kids earlier. And I think um, we know too many families experience long wait lists. So I think the Head to Help Hubs are an amazing initiative to, you know, go into the community and see where families are. And I think it is a big part of the solution to what we're seeing in our communities. The, um, the long Melbourne lockdowns, particularly Melbourne, but everywhere, as Patrick was saying, the, the pandemic, the shadow pandemic, has had a big, big impact on the mental wellbeing of Victorians of all ages, kids, their parents, young adults, as Patrick was saying. For some, life and death stress. From your vantage point, what facilities, what resources are needed to deal with this load, this path to wellbeing? Are you seeing them flowing and what's working? Yeah, so it was a big issue before the pandemic because we know that one in seven kids aged four to 17 years of age met criteria for a mental illness. That's huge. And we know that, you know, as Professor McGorry would talk about, a lot of these kids uh, go on and have adult mental illness. We know 50% of adult mental illness starts in childhood. I think the pandemic has had a number of effects on the community and worsened mental health in our whole community for a lot of families. I think what we need to do is use the current resources better. I think there's amazing initiatives about how we collaborate better as professionals. And I don't just mean clinicians. You know, educators spend a lot of time with these kids and that's why I'm really lucky to research and do a lot of work directly with educators so that they can identify kids that are struggling, catch them early, support them, know where to get help. Um, and the same across the health sector, just thinking about how do we collaborate. We do need more resources, but I think we can use the ones that we have existing in an even better way. OK. Um, mental illness can be fatal, Patrick, we know that. And there's money in this Tasmanian announcement today for the aftercare services for when a person leaves hospital after a suicide attempt. Uh, the government's got a suicide prevention plan. The Prime Minister today noted that, con talking about the pandemic again, contrary to fears and maybe expectations, suicide rates actually went down in the first year of the pandemic slightly. Patrick McGorry, is that testament, do you think, to the federal and state government's focus on suicide risk due to the pandemic? Is that a success statistic? I think that the suicide rate did go down in older adults, um, so that meant that it looked like it, it didn't rise across the whole lifespan. There's, there's, there's very little evidence that went down in young people, and in fact, the, the, the rate of suicidal behaviour um, was a paper just about to be published um, in the international literature um, showing the, the facts of that, that huge surge in suicidal behaviour in adolescents um, in Australia <coughs> during the pandemic. Um, so. Um, I think the government did a very good job in, in, in stemming the tide in older people because um, the job keeper, I think, really, um, it was more the economic and the, and the protection of the, the fabric of society through those sorts of uh, initiatives was probably the protective factor there because, because um, I, you know, certainly in younger people where there was much more disruption to their lives, we, we see that, uh, we, we've seen a huge surge in risk um, and, uh, to those young people. We, probably not, not a rise in, in suicide rates, except perhaps in the very younger adolescents, but certainly a 50% increase in presentations to emergency departments, um, which is very well documented in all the major states. So, so I think 
Um, we don't want to get complacent about this. And we've certainly seen, um, uh, apart from the death rates from, from mental illness, we've, we've seen um, a very serious um, cloud hanging over the futures of, of these uh, these emerging adults. OK. Billy, uh, Mag uh, Billy Garvey, are you seeing a higher suicide risk within kids, school kids particularly, I'm thinking, and have you seen that as a feature of the pandemic? What's been happening? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as a general rule, kids who have, you know, thinking that we worry about so much as, as that in suicidal thoughts, they're really hard to see early on because they often will talk to their peers and their family. And I think that directs us towards we need to provide better health education around everything around mental health, but especially about kids who are having suicidal thinking. We also know that it's become harder during the pandemic to actually access supports. It's been some great initiatives with telehealth and the hubs that have been set up. But I think we need to be recognised that a lot of these kids were identifying them too late and the pandemic has really exacerbated how hidden these kids are until they get to quite a detrimental state of functioning. So I think it's a really exciting opportunity to how do we catch them earlier. These kids all send up flares. We spot a lot of these kids in primary school. We spot a lot of these kids even before they get to primary school and we can tell they're going to go on and have problems. It's an amazing mm -hmm. opportunity to catch them early and bring in support. OK. Um, Patrick, for many elections, you, Ian Hickey, John Mendoza and others have been urging governments to make transformational investment in mental health. Now, the, the Morrison government over the past two years has doubled funding for mental health and suicide prevention to more than $6 billion. I'm sure you went in with a wish list for this election. What is the plan you put to the government and opposition? And do you think you've had any success? Because this funding we heard today is actually funding that's already been announced in, in, in the national plan. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, friend. And, I, and I, obviously, I, I don't want to say that what, what the government is doing, like, as, as Billy is saying, and this is very welcome, you know, what, what, what they are doing. So it, it's, not, it's not like, um, um, it, it's not a criticism of that. But, but um, it, it's a scale issue and, and an urgency issue, I suppose. Um, increasing it to six billion on the Commonwealth side is a significant shift. But if you just compare what's being spent on the NDIS, $29 billion a year for 500,000 people, you know, obviously a very important program. We're spending $10 billion, including that $6 billion that the Commonwealth puts in. Maybe it's a bit more now, actually, to be fair. But that's the ballpark, and that's 5 million Australians. Ten times as many people are expected to be covered by that. So we're off, off the... Um, off beam in terms of the scale of what we're aiming for. So that's what, when you talk about national reform programs, we've got to actually scale things up more quickly and, and more decisively. And we can't do that unless we also address things like workforce, because even when we have money, which we do now have in Victoria through the post Royal Commission, we're getting good investments from that state government, other state governments not so much. Um, but um, we, we, we have trouble actually building because the workforce issues have not been addressed. So money is, is crucial, but and, and the platforms of care, which the government has listened to us on in terms of designing the right type of, you know, physical platform in the community close to where people live, and, and exactly what Billy is saying, to have a safety net before people end up in a much more serious state. So they, the government is listening to the policy proposals, but... You know, the, the rate of change and, and, the, and the, the target to where you get to, Scott Morrison talks about the finishing line is, is always, you know, receding, and he's quite right. But, but you've got to actually, you know, have, have the training program to get to the finishing line, and, and, and that means we've got to get a lot stronger and a lot, a lot more decisive uh, in the next phase. We want to see not rear-view mirror announcements, but actually forward-looking announcements which build that system more, 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 more quickly. Billy Garvey, in your area, in terms of scalability, I mean, I've talked to an, you know, an enormous number of people who have concerns about their kids who just simply can't get their kids into the counselling or the supports they need. I mean, how... These are not quick issues, training a workforce, are they? So can you see the plans in the works, the looking into the future, the crystal ball? Uh, no crystal ball, unfortunately, but I don't think that the answer is everyone gets into a room with a clinician one-on-one. -on -one. I think uh, Professor McGarry builds a lot of the evidence around early intervention. If we catch these kids earlier, there's less resources that mm. are needed for them. We just need yeah. to skill up the people around them to know how to identify them, and that's families, it's teachers, it's footy coaches, it's art teachers, you know, it's the swimming coach. Those are the people that have the trusted relationships with these kids and families. If we catch them then and put evidence-based practices in to support them and make sure they thrive, they don't get to the point where they need to have help and see a specialist for 
thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, that's those services need to exist and they take a long time to build. But if we really collaborate and build health literacy, that's a such lower level of cost and it's it's one that pays off you know, really dramatically in the benefits to all of us in the community, not just the families that are supporting a kid that's struggling. OK, Patrick McGorry, final word from you. Uh, we had this announcement from the government today. Heard very little from Labor on mental health. I mean, just a, one small announcement is all I could see. Are you expecting more? And do you have a message just finally and briefly for both parties in the nine days left about the cost of not doing more? Yeah, I, I don't know whether to expect more. We've certainly put blueprints in front of in front of um, both the, the government and and, and the opposition, um, and you know more more needs to be done. No one denies that on either side of politics. So I I think you know um, it, it, the country needs there to be more announcements. Whether they'll come or not, I, I really can't say. It's 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 um it's up to them. But certainly beyond the election we have to keep building and I, and I think what Billy was saying is exactly right it's got to be done at all levels but the bit that's missing in my world you know the bit that I see is is the hundreds and hundreds of young people with potentially very serious conditions on our wait list right now in the northwest of Melbourne and we we are struggling you know our clinicians are struggling they're exhausted after the pandemic so that so we, we really need to take this a lot more seriously. All sides of politics need to understand that. That's not to dismiss the value of the announcements the Prime Minister made today and the opposition are supporting, um, but, but it really has to go to another level. OK. Patrick McGorry and Billy Garvey, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Fran. Well, the seat of Warringah used to be as blue-ribbon liberal as they get. Uh, that was, of course, until three years ago when Tony Abbott was unceremoniously dumped by his voters in favour of an independent. These days, the liberal candidate there has great notoriety, stretching far beyond the boundaries of Warringah. To outsiders, Catherine Deeves' campaign appears more like a single-issue independence than a major party's at times, but she is now receiving some public backing from the long-time former member and Prime Minister. The more I see of Catherine Deves, the more impressed I am with her courage, with her common sense, with her decency and with, quite frankly, her capacity to win this seat back for the Liberal Party. So I really do urge all Ringer Liberals to get behind our candidate. She is our candidate. She's doing a good job and she deserves to be supported of whatever faults we might see uh, in the selection process. Uh, we've got to do this to get behind her for our community, for our party, for our country and to help give the Morrison government the victory that our country needs. OK, a call to arms. So let's check in now on some of the moving parts still whirring away on week five of the campaign. To do that, we have Liberal Senator Eric Abetz joining us from Hobart and Labor's Stephen Jones is in Wollongong. Welcome back to both of you. I don't want to dwell too long on this, but since we did just touch on the seat of Warringah, Eric Abetz, to you, I'm interested in your thoughts. I know there was a report strenuously denied today that suggested there might have been some coordination around the Catherine D campaign out of the Prime Minister's office. Uh, let's take that as denied, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Uh, do you think the issues that are emanating from that candidate are resonating in, say, the state of Tasmania that you observe? The uh, Tasmanian people, and I think all Australians, uh, accept the very strong view that Catherine has uh, put forward, and that is that female sports ought be the domain of uh, uh, women. That is something that is uh, fundamentally important for their safety and fairness. And uh, whilst there has been a lot of uh, media interest in what Catherine Deves has been said in the past, mm. it's a pity that we don't have as much interest on the very ugly sexist things uh, that the Labor member for Lyons, for example, has said in the past. And uh, I just wish there was a bit of evening up in relation to that. But look, how Catherine Deves may have expressed 
expressed herself in the past is one thing, but the principle of that which she has said is uh, overwhelmingly supported by the Australian people. All right. Uh, Stephen Jones, I know this uh, hits close to home for you. Just a general observation. I say we don't have time for a deep dive, but does this mm. appear coordinated, orchestrated as a campaign from, from where you would sit? Look, it really does. You know, what I find interesting is you just did a 15-minute segment on mental health and particularly the impact on young kids when we know that there is a five times greater incidence of suicide ideation and self-harm and severe mental health issues with young kids who are going through gender dysphoria, young kids uh, from gay and lesbian background, to have the candidate for Warringah backed by the Prime Minister doubling down to reignite a debate for pure political purposes it is not only despicable, it's reckless. It's done with the Prime Minister's licence. That is obvious to everybody. And frankly, the big gap between what the Prime Minister says and what he does is growing day by day. Mm. The best way that we can do something to help young people with mental health issues is ensure that we don't add to the list of people who are already suffering. And every day Scott Morrison gives Ms Deves a licence to go out there and do her gender-baiting rubbish, which isn't an issue, is a day that we add to that list of young people with mental health issues. All right. Let's move on to, uh, I suppose, more conventional uh, topics of debate right in the middle of this campaign, and that's wages. Stephen Jones, back to you. Can you explain to us who an Albanese government uh, will make a submission to Fair Work Commission on behalf of and how that will be expressed in any submission? Sure. The Fair Work Commission does an annual review of wages more often if the circumstances require. It has not been unusual for Labor governments to intervene in those matters and make a submission. It's also with numbers? been the case with, from time to time that a coalition... Percentages? Yeah, with numbers, yeah, yeah. With, numbers no, with a position, no, with that is incorrect. View. Hang on, Eric, you'll get your chance. You'll get your chance, Eric. Love to hear from you on whether you think wages should go up or down or whether workers should get a pay cut or not. It is not unusual for a government to make a submission in support of a particular wage increase mm. and to give detailed information about the economic circumstances. Now, here's the situation. You've got Labor, you've got Anthony Albanese saying wages should go up so that they can keep pace with cost of living increases. Yes. And you've got Scott Morrison who is saying wages should be cut because they should not uh, keep pace, sure. pace with the price that of living increases. That is just false. A clear it. difference. Yep. And if that is just if, if, false. If, look, if Eric, if Eric thinks there is a different position... He should state it because yesterday in the great debate, Scott Morrison was saying wages should go backwards in real terms yep. and Anthony Albanese is saying wages should keep pace okay. with cost of living. Well, I'm going to ask clear Erica difference Betts. between the parties. Yeah, I'm going to ask Erica Betts to do that uh, just in a moment or very shortly. But, Stephen, just back to you for a point of clarification. Based on what Anthony Albanese mm -hmm. said today, is there, to use my term, likely to be a firewall? One which says the submission would relate to 270-odd thousand people on the minimum wage and not to see any 5.1% increase flow through to upwards of, of 3 million? Well, there is a relationship between the minimum wage and other rates within the award, but, like, again, let's be very clear. We don't think over the next year workers' wages should go backwards. Mm. Scott Morrison does. And unless you are adjusting wages to keep pace with cost of living increases, it's quite simple. Wages are going backwards. It's a pay cut. If you're barracking for a pay cut, just say it so right. that everyone knows what they're voting on. OK, Erica Betts, you've waited patiently. Uh, so to this question of inserting numbers, 5.1 is the number, uh, you're saying that there is no precedent for this, are you? No precedent whatsoever and, in fact, during the three years of opposition, each year when the Fair Work Commission has considered what the pay rate ought be, Federal Labor has failed to even put in a submission. Now, on the cusp of an election, they want to be the champion of a pay increase of 5.1 per cent, which is, in, is tantamount to bullying the Fair Work Commission. But it they're is independent. They independent can look through this umpire. stuff, can't they? It is, Can I give it you five is, examples is, of precedent? It, five examples it, it, of precedent. Accords right, on, one, I, two, three, four and five. There's your precedent. It, 
Accords 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. There's your precedent. I agree with Eric. They never did it because they did not back workers' wages. Is somebody Five moderating this? Is somebody moderating this? You uh, never did. OK, Stephen. Is somebody moderating this? Yep. Uh, Go ahead. When I had a two-word interjection, Steve Jones took great umbrage. And this is classic Labor. Say one You're thing. Right. Go do the Go exact it, opposite. Yeah. And what we have always said is that we have an independent umpire that should never be monstered by a would be Prime Minister or an actual Prime Minister. And Mr Morrison quite rightly said to the Australian people that it is the independent umpire after considering the submissions of employees and employers to come to a rate which is um, a fair and reasonable thing in all the circumstances. There is no magic pudding in this. As a former Labor Treasurer said, one man's pay rise, and this was Frank Crean, his exact words, one man's pay rise can be another man's job. Mm. And that is what has to be guarded against. And very carefully, we need to look at what will be the impact on small business and other people's jobs if sure. there were to be a $38 per week increase on the minimum wage rate, which 5.1% translates to. Yeah, there will be economic consequences. That is why we have an independent umpire to work all this out, come to a determination. And, Steve, look, everybody wants a wage increase. We get that. We understand that. But how do you get sustainable wage increases like we did under the Howard government with a 19 per cent increase in real wages through sustainable economic management without any inflationary pressures? That's the standard, and that is what the Morrison what government the last would seek years? to be able to achieve. And, look, the last nine years have been unprecedented. First of all, Labor had to deal with a global financial crisis. Now we have had the um, problems of the pandemic and the government has been able to save literally hundreds of thousands of Australian jobs through its economic management yeah. in a situation where your own people, Steve, said that if we could keep the unemployment rate below 6.25%, we'd be doing well. Well, here we are, 2% lower than the benchmark you yourselves had set, which shows that we as economic management uh, managers can achieve a better result than Labor could even dream of. Right. And at the end of the You've day, an eight, we want people in jobs. Dollar deficit, an $80 billion oh, deficit please. and a trillion dollars worth of debt. This is your economic management? You All spend right. well, we, $30 we, billion dollars on a $3 billion block of land? We might have even the ledger there on so, our time. So, right. so, so you wouldn't have done job keeper. All right, let's let <laughs> you wrap up on wages. You wouldn't have done job keeper. <laughs> since I think we've tried, to be, uh, never get tried to be as even-handed yeah. as we could. There. Can I just take you, since you want to talk about national security, Stephen Jones, just finally, uh, mm. there's been a, an allegation from Labor today that in some way the Morrison, well, it wasn't the Morrison government, but Scott Morrison was, was Treasurer at the time, may have materially assisted the privatisation to ultimately Chinese interest, the port of Darwin through an, an asset recycling payment. Uh, how, is that ex actually true when uh, that payment would have been made regardless of who bought it? It's a payment that was made because of Scott Morrison's policy. It's a payment that was made to incentivise the sale of this port to a Chinese government-backed instrumentality. Scott Morrison has been standing back and saying, this has nothing to do with me. Well, there is a $20 billion trail that links Scott Morrison's pen million, to the sale think, of the port yeah. to the Chinese. $20 billion, sorry, $20 million, yep. I apologise. There is a $20 million trail... A great economic ..which manager. links Scott Morrison's pen... Scott Morrison's pen to the port of Darwin. Nobody has had anything more critical to say about the Chinese than Erica Betts. What's Erica Betts got to say about incentive payments going from the Commonwealth Government right. to the Northern Territory well, Government? We are virtually to out sell of time, but since you're, to the it, since you're inviting it, you're inviting it, Stephen, uh, very briefly, Erica Betts, uh, yeah, asset recycling, twenty million dollars. 
Uh, at the end of the day, I think if we had our time over again, people would reconsider the, these decisions. But let's be very clear, did Labor raise a single voice against this move at mm. the time? I did. No, they didn't. And so what they're doing, what they're doing is saying, oh, look, with the benefit of hindsight, no. wouldn't we have been smarter? The simple fact is that uh, we, as an Australian government, are being very, very serious in relation to the threats that are coming from China, yep. unlike the Labor Party. Well, and look, for the record, I've been against foreign uh, sales of our assets uh, or of our real estate uh, for some considerable yep. period now, of time. there is time. a consistency there. Understood and noted. Uh, we are clean out of time. Erica Betts and Stephen Jones, uh, get back to campaigning, both of you, and thanks for joining us today. Well, indeed. Thanks a lot. Good to be with you. Well, well, most of the election campaign coverage at any election is focused on the lower house seats, which determine ultimately who forms government. There's always a contest going on in the Senate, of course, and this year's is pretty interesting. I'm joined now by Ben Oakworth, Executive Director for the Australia Institute. And in a moment, political consultant Glenn Drury will join us. You might remember his name. He was once infamously known as the Preference Whisperer. Ben Oakworth, we've got you first. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Uh, ben, we've been talking a lot about what seats to watch, but what about the Senate race? You're a Senate watcher from way back. Do we see any surprises coming in the Senate? Oh, we do, Fran. And it's important to remember the people who got two votes. You're right. The first vote with the House of Representatives ultimately determines who forms government, but it's often the Senate that determines what comes next. And Australia has a powerful Senate, you know, effectively the same powers as the House of Representatives can block any government uh, legislation. Uh, it's been uh, famous for uh, blocking supply uh, in the past. And there's been a lot of focus on the House and whether there will be a, a minority a parliament, whether the crossbench will uh, have balance of power. But one thing we know already before the anyone's cast a ballot is that uh, the crossbench will again hold balance of power in the Senate. Neither major party will control uh, the Senate following the election. Only half the Senate goes to the polls each time. Six senators in each state. Let's go through the basic maths. Uh, generally, um, the Coalition wins at least two of those seats and Labor wins at least two of those seats, leaving two seats being uh, fought out um, between uh, the Coalition and minor parties. And there are a number of interesting Senate races around the country that will determine the overall balance of power in the Senate. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's go to some of them now. Let's go to Queensland because the way I see it, the big contest there could be for one of those seats between Clive Palmer and Pauline Hanson, or am I wrong? Are, are they, could they both get up? Who's likely to win a contest there, in your view? Well, I, I think you're right. It has boiled down to that. A lot of people have talked about Queensland as being interesting because the Coalition is trying to win three seats. So Senator Amanda Stoker is trying to win the third seat for the Coalition. But... I think given where the polls are, it's very difficult for her. And really, um, I think the Greens are going to win a seat uh, in Queensland. All the evidence uh, points to the Greens actually being on a tear in Queensland and their vote, uh, our polling has their vote up in Queensland. So that gives them a seat. Presumably Labor will win two seats this time. They didn't uh, they last time, did they? No, they had a terrible election last time, but most people think they will th th win two and the Coalition will win two. Uh, and the Greens will be one, leaving one last seat to be fought over. And there was talk that the Coalition was in the hunt, but I think you're right. I think the more in, more likely possibility is it's a race between Pauline Hanson and Clive Palmer, who's actually heading the ticket there. And our polling has had uh, United Australia Party creeping up and now level pegging with Pauline Hanson for that last seat. Now, I think most people think in the end Pauline Hanson will get there, but I do think there is now a chance that Clive Palmer could knock out Pauline Hanson and it is one of the interesting races to watch. But there are plenty others around the country too. Yeah, we'll come to those. But just to say with Queensland, former Liberal uh, MP George Christensen quit the, quit the party at this election. He joined One Nation. He's number three on their ticket, so that's completely unwinnable there in that third Senate spot. But does does his presence, do you think, pull votes across to One Nation, his anti-vax votes versus Clive Palmer's freedom sort of wagon? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think so. I think he's well down the ticket. He, I think he's pretty immaterial to the campaign. But there's no doubt that this time um, Clive Palmer and, and Paul and Hanson are feeding into a genuine constituency. And I think Palmer in the past has been just kind of all over the place. Now, it's a small, but the anti-lockdown, anti-vax vote is real and Palmer is struggling to get uh, uh, that off Pauline Hanson. Now there's probably enough between them to win a Senate seat that's partly cannibalising each other's vote. 
but you'd imagine in Queensland there's enough between them to win a, a okay. Senate vote. Actually, we found that the Palmer vote has been as strong in Victoria as it has been in Queensland, um, uh, potentially as a response to the to the lockdowns in Victoria. Small, um, but just just as strong there as it was in Queensland. Okay, I think having we... said that, of course, he's competing with Pauline Hanson in Queensland, so they're they're splitting the vote there to some extent. All right, I think we've got Glenn Drury joining us now. Glenn, thank you very much for joining us. We've just been talking a lot about Queensland, but can we go to another of the Senate races now? Um, and I'm looking at Tasmania, where Erica Betts has posters and billboards everywhere, I'm told, across the Apple Isle. He's in the unwinnable third spot on the Liberal ticket. Um, will Erica Betts surprise us and get up below the line? Do you think he's in a contest with Jackie Lambie for a seat? Glenn, do you have a view on this? I think that last spot in Tasmania uh, is up for grabs. And uh, I, I'd have to say the smart money is on Jackie. Uh, or Jackie's Jackie's candidate. Um, I think that Eric will be buying the equivalent of the Age or the the Herald on Monday after the election and looking for a new job. I, honestly, the smart money's got to be on Jackie. I think Tasmania will come down to uh, probably two Labor, a Green, two Libs, and that last spot will be a fight. But Jackie is most likely to win that fight. Okay, um, Ben. Do you think if Erica Betts did manage to get up, that it w would that necessarily be at the co at the cost of one of the other Liberals above the line? Just well, briefly? it's interesting. It's interesting. I, I think it's unlikely. I think Glenn's right. I think um, the Jackie Lambie network's in the box uh, seat there, despite some new parties there, that, like the local party, having a go. I think I think she is in her candidate is in the box uh, seat. But it is interesting that you point about Erica Betts's signs being all over the state. I'm reliably informed, like you, Fran, that they certainly are. But he's urging people to vote below the line now. Vote below the line for him means uh, effectively voting against the number one and number two candidates yeah. on the ticket, um, and I think I think it's hard. I think um, in a double dissolution, we have seen Tasmanian senators win uh, in such a strategy. Lisa Singh for Labor Party won, but it was in a double dissolution election. Okay. Tasmanian voters are used to uh, uh, voting below the line because of the Hare Clark system in the House of Representatives, but I think in yeah. a half Senate, it's hard. And I, I do think um, that there's a big chance that uh, Jackie Lambie Network could, could oust Erica Betts at this election. All right. Can we look at the ACT? Because there was um, a big splash in the Canberra Times this week suggesting that Labor's, Labor's Katie Gallagher could be ousted by the independent running David Pocock, former Wallaby captain, of course. Um, two spots, four contenders, big contenders in the main box seat, Zed Sajelja on the um, on the Conservative side, Katie Gallagher, David Pocock and Kim Rubenstein, two independents on the on the other side. Um, Glenn, who do you, is Katie Gallagher in trouble, do you think? I think that the territories are the hardest to win. The quota for a Senate spot elsewhere in the country is about 14.29%. It is 14.29%. In the ACT, of course, it's just over 33%. Mm. While I acknowledge that there is a possibility that the independent could win, I think it's going to be a very tough call to get to that uh, that magic 30 per cent plus. Is it, it, that's, that's a long way up for an independent. So I, I, my view is it'll probably be uh, the status quo will remain. All right, you're there in the ACT, Ben. Just briefly, what do you think? Oh, it's been a huge campaign from Pocock. You know, the polling had him at, at 10 per cent two or three weeks ago and now at 20 per cent. So he's a big chance. Um, you heard Katie Gallagher on, uh, Gallagher on radio this morning talking about not taking the seat for granted and not being entitled to it and she was working hard for it. I do think it's a, a, a big contest. It is hard for a non-major party uh, candidate to break through but if anybody could do it, um, Pocock can do it and um, for once the ACT's got a contest. Mm. Uh, that's good for uh, good for democracy, if nothing else. Well, I tell you, there's a, a contest in South Australia, Glenn, an old face on the ballot papers, Nick Xenophon trying to get up. Yeah. Uh, to quote the castle, tell him he's dreaming. What do you think? Uh, look, Nick's... The voters are fickle. You know, Nick, Nick's been out of the scene now for a little while, and people tend to forget. Let's not forget what Paul Keating alluded to over 30 years ago, that voters aren't too bright. And... Uh, I think it's going to be hard for the voters to find Nick on the ballot paper. He's at position U, as I, as I recall. Uh, he is, doesn't have his name above the line, so he's just got a little square above the line. People are going to have to go hunting to find Nick. Um, and we know from the example of the New South Wales 2011 election when Pauline Hanson ran as a grouped independent, she just had that little box above the line without her name. 
and she struggled. She really struggled. Okay. In fact, the informal vote was, was very high. But that last spot in South Australia is certainly up for grabs. In my view, we will probably get two Labor and a Green, two Libs, and that last spot. Who's going for it? I'm, look, the short odds are probably on Nick, but I wouldn't take anything for granted. All right, we are almost out of time, so I need to ask both of you for a prediction, really, if you would. Uh, at the end of all this, what's the Senate going to look like? Who's going to hold the balance of power? Glenn? Uh, if Labor wins, it'll be the Greens. If the Coalition wins, if, if, if uh, ScoMo finds another miracle, and they could be hard to come by, but if he does, it'll be a, a combination of Pauline, of Jackie Lambie Network, and possibly another minor party. Ben Oakwes, how do you see it? Well, uh, interesting you focus on South Australia there. I think it's the most interesting and important state Senate race in this country. The Greens are trying to get up a new Senator, Barbara Pocock, there, who's got a good chance. Nick Xenophon's trying to make a return. Rex Patrick's trying to, trying to stay in the uh -huh. Senate. And if Labor and the Greens could win four seats between them, it would materially change the balance of power in the Senate. So it's a small state, uh, but I think the balance of power uh, could well be determined by what happens in South Australia. OK, we'll be hanging on watching for that. I think we're not going to get a result on the Senate on the night, that's for sure. It usually takes a lot longer. Ben Oakwes, Glenn Dury, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Thank Fran. Yes, the Senate, endlessly mysterious and fascinating. You don't hear much about it, do you, on election night as all I've been eyes following turn... politics for a long time, Greg, and I struggle, struggle really to understand it. That's why I've got two people who have really drilled down and watched yeah. the Senate for a long time to, to join us today. Well, they're among the best in the business because it does take a, a certain capacity to peer into those numbers. And, uh, yeah, it's the long-forgotten chamber, really, uh, which could be uh, pivotal with any government, whether we're talking a majority or a minority government's agenda once it hits the Red Room. So uh, let's see where that takes us. And uh, yeah, we're keeping our eyes on the weather, or I am anyway, Fran, <laughs> because uh, we're hoping to make a dash to sunny Queensland uh, tomorrow, in fact, but uh, not quite certain about that. We'll, we'll see how the flights go. It's pretty wet up and around Brisbane, but uh, that was our intention. Hopefully it still will be for tomorrow, Fran. Yeah. I hope to. I hope to be joining you, seeing you join us from sunny Brisbane tomorrow. See you later. Thanks.